Welcome back to the Real Crime Diary Daily Dose of Crime. I am your host, MHB, and today we delve into a truly harrowing and complex case that raises profound questions about justice, trauma, and the consequences of systemic abuse. In today's episode, we're exploring the case of Lauren Cole, a Florida death row inmate whose story has taken an unexpected and deeply troubling turn. Recently, Cole has made headlines by pleading to vacate his death sentence, a plea grounded in the horrific abuses he endured during his teenage years at the notorious Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys. For those unfamiliar, Lauren Cole was convicted of the brutal 1994 murder of John Edwards, a Florida State University student. The crime was exceptionally violent, leading to Cole's death sentence a year later. But the narrative we're uncovering today is far more layered, as it shines a glaring light on the dark, abusive history of Dozier, a reform school that has left a trail of shattered lives in its wake. Lauren Cole's lawyers argue that the torture and abuse he suffered at Dozier significantly shaped the man who sits on death row today. They are appealing for his life to be spared, presenting his experiences as mitigating factors that the original jury never had the opportunity to consider. Cole was just 17 when he entered Dozier, and his time there, marked by systematic rape, beatings, and crippling injuries at the hands of staff, resurfaced in his memory only after watching a documentary on the school's abuses years later. This episode will unpack the latest legal developments in Cole's case, examine the grim history of Dozier through the eyes of its survivors, and weigh the moral and legal implications of Cole's plea. Should a history of abuse alter our perception of an individual's culpability? Can there be redemption after such dark chapters in one's life? Please join me as we navigate through the layered and often heart-wrenching world that connects childhood trauma, legal responsibility, and the ethics of the death penalty. Lauren Cole's life has been marked by a series of tragic and violent events, both as a victim and a perpetrator. Born into a tumultuous environment, Cole experienced instability and abuse from a young age. This early exposure to violence set the stage for a troubled adolescent period that would ultimately lead him down a path of crime. At 17, Cole was sent to the Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys in Florida, a place later exposed for its rampant abuse and mistreatment of its inmates. This six-month stint at Dozier left deep scars, both physical and emotional, that, as we'll discuss later, are at the heart of Cole's current legal battle. Fast forward 10 years to 1994 and Lauren Cole is entangled in a crime that would change his life forever. On a seemingly ordinary day, John Edwards, a Florida State University student, decided to spend some leisure time camping in the Ocala National Forest with his sister, a student from Eckerd College. Their peaceful escape into nature turned into a nightmare on February 18, 1994, when they crossed paths with Cole and his accomplice, William Paul. According to court records, Cole and Paul joined the siblings at their campsite. Sometime later, when they walked to a nearby pond, the atmosphere quickly turned dark. Cole assaulted Edward's sister, knocking her to the ground and handcuffing her. This act of violence was a prelude to the grisly murder of John Edwards. Cole and Paul separated the siblings, with Paul taking Edward's sister up a trail while Cole assaulted John Edwards. Edwards suffered a brutal, fatal assault, which included a slashed throat and severe blows to the head that resulted in a fractured skull. Meanwhile, Paul's actions were no less horrific. He sexually assaulted Edwards' sister, who was left tied to two trees until she managed to free herself the next morning. The news of this heinous crime spread rapidly, and it wasn't long before Cole and Paul were apprehended. The trial that followed was swift and decisive. In 1995, Lauren Cole was convicted of first-degree murder, kidnapping, and sexual battery. The jury, after hearing the gruesome details of the crime, recommended the death penalty, a decision that the judge upheld. During the trial, evidence of Cole's troubled past, including the abuse he suffered as a child, was presented as mitigating factors. However, despite these revelations, the jury and the state determined that the nature of his crimes warranted the ultimate punishment. Cole has spent nearly three decades on death row, during which time his case has seen numerous appeals and legal maneuvers. His conviction and sentence have been upheld despite persistent claims from his legal team that the abuse he endured at the Dozier School for Boys was never fully considered during his original sentencing. As we delve deeper into Cole's case, it's essential to hold in mind both his actions and his claims of past trauma. 
This complexity is at the core of the current legal proceedings, as his lawyers argue that the torturous treatment he experienced at state-run facilities like Dozier significantly impacted his trajectory of life choices. With Governor Ron DeSantis recently signing a warrant for Cole's execution, scheduled for August 29, 2024, the case has taken on new urgency. It raises critical questions about justice, accountability, and the extent to which past abuses should factor into the finality of a death sentence. Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys, nestled in the small town of Mariana, Florida, holds a dark chapter in the annals of American history. Established in 1900 and operational for over a century, this reform school was intended to rehabilitate troubled youth. Instead, it became synonymous with brutality and abuse. The school's legacy is so tarnished that it was finally shut down in 2011, but the scars it left on its inmates are indelible. Imagine a place where young boys, many sent for minor offenses like truancy or running away from home, were greeted not with opportunities for growth, but with unimaginable torment. Former students of Dozier, known today as the White House Boys, have come forward to recount their harrowing experiences. Their stories paint a bleak picture of relentless beatings, sexual abuse, and mental torment. One of the most terrifying places on the Dozier campus was the White House, a small, nondescript building where boys were taken for punishment. It is from this building that the group of survivors derive their name. The abuse within the White House was methodical and relentless. Survivors describe being beaten until they were unconscious, their clothes soaked in blood. The walls of the White House were said to reverberate with the screams of young boys enduring unimaginable pain. The abhorrent practices at Dozier extended beyond physical beatings. Psychological abuse was rampant. Boys were often isolated, shackled, and forced to perform demeaning tasks. Many former students recall being stripped of their dignity, treated as less than human. Racial discrimination was another sickening layer to the abuse, where African-American boys, kept segregated from their white counterparts, reportedly faced even harsher conditions. But perhaps the most chilling aspect of Dozier's history is the discovery of unmarked graves on its grounds. Decades after the school's closure, forensic investigators found the remains of dozens of boys buried without records or explanations. Some were never even identified. The exact number of those who died due to abuse, neglect, or under suspicious circumstances at Dozier remains unknown. This macabre discovery underscores the lethal consequences of the unchecked power that Dozier's staff wielded over the boys entrusted to their care. For many years, the voices of the White House boys went unheard. They fought tirelessly to bring their stories to light and hold those responsible accountable. Their persistence eventually led to state hearings where they could share testimonies of the horrors they faced. Their relentless advocacy resulted in Florida lawmakers acknowledging the severe abuse that occurred within the walls of Dozier. In 2024, an important milestone was reached. Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill allocating $20 million to compensate individuals who suffered abuse at Dozier and another state reform school between 1940 and 1975. This was a significant step in recognizing the state's role in these atrocities. However, this compensation came with limitations. Only living survivors within the stipulated time frame were eligible excluding individuals like Lauren Cole, who attended Dozier in the early 1980s. This acknowledgement by the state sets a crucial precedent. It is an admission of guilt and a step toward rectifying the injustices that marred countless lives. This reparation recognizes that the abuse that occurred at Dozier wasn't merely the result of rogue individuals, but a systemic failure that spanned generations. Yet the case of Lauren Cole challenges us to scrutinize the sufficiency of these efforts. Cole, among others, asserts that the abuse he endured at Dozier was a pivotal factor in his later behavior and criminal acts. For him, the tormenting beatings and rapes weren't just traumatic memories, but catalysts that shaped his troubled journey into adulthood. As his lawyers argue, the state's admission of the Dozier atrocities indeed changes the perception and impact of the mitigation his jury was presented. The legacy of the Dozier School for Boys, therefore, is multifaceted. It's a stark reminder of how institutional abuse can warp lives and futures. It poses profound questions about accountability, justice, and the long road to healing. Listening to the stories of the White House boys and understanding the full extent of the abuse at Dozier isn't just about acknowledging the past. It's about reckoning with its enduring impact on the present and ensuring that such nightmares are never allowed to unfold again.
These stories implore us all to remain vigilant against any forms of abuse and to ensure that institutions meant to protect and rehabilitate do not become arenas of unchecked cruelty. Lauren Cole's tragic time at the Arthur G. Dozier School for Boys is not merely a recollection of harsh memories. It is a haunting testament to the dark chapters of institutional abuse that many juveniles endured. Cole, sent to Dozier at the age of 17 in 1984, suffered experiences too heinous to be forgotten or ignored. His story, though, is not just about what happened inside those walls, but how those traumatic episodes have become a pivotal element in his legal battle against his death sentence. At Dozier, Cole asserts he was subjected to relentless abuse. According to court documents, he endured beatings at least twice a week, and on one horrifying occasion, a guard raped him. These beatings left him physically broken, with instances where his legs were fractured as a consequence of trying to escape the brutal environment. These experiences, ingrained deeply in his psyche, are now being brought to light as a crucial argument in his plea for life over death. Cole's attorneys argue that the abuse he faced at Dozier significantly impacted his mental state and life trajectory, ultimately leading him down a path that culminated in the murder for which he now faces execution. They emphasize that these traumatic experiences were not disclosed to the jury during his 1995 trial, a critical omission considering how deeply they might have influenced the jury's sentencing decision. The legal argument hinges on the assertion that had the jury been aware of the torture Cole suffered, they might have been more inclined to opt for a life sentence over death. His legal team, led by Ali Shakur and Adrian Joy Shepard, contends that Cole's behavior and decisions were profoundly shaped by the severe abuse at Dozier, thus pleading for leniency in light of this newly discovered evidence. They insist Cole is a product of the state's negligence and horrific mistreatment, and therefore, it's unjust for the state to now exact the ultimate punishment on him. Opposing this, the state's attorneys argue that Cole's allegations aren't new to the courts. They state these claims have been part of his appeals over the years. According to their arguments, the details of his childhood abuse, including his time at Dozier, were already considered during his initial trial as mitigating factors. They underscore that the jury was made aware of his troubled past before deciding on the death penalty. Moreover, Attorney General Ashley Moody's office points out that revisiting these claims doesn't offer new grounds sufficient to overturn a death sentence that has been continuously upheld through numerous appeals. They argue there is no reasonable basis to believe that the jury would have rendered a different verdict had they known the specifics of his abuse at Dozier given that they were already considering his abusive childhood background. Further complicating Cole's plea is the political landscape surrounding his case. Governor Ron DeSantis signed his death warrant shortly after endorsing a bill which allocated $20 million to compensate those abused at Dozier, recognizing at a state level the profound impact of the institution's abuses. This juxtaposition has drawn sharp criticism, with many arguing it is paradoxical to provide reparation for abuse victims while executing one of its most damaged survivors. In the context of Cole's suppressed memories re-emerging after watching a documentary about Dozier, his lawyers suggest these memories should reopen his case to consider a more merciful sentence. They argue that these revived recollections paint a more complete picture of the trauma Cole endured, which was not fully grasped during his original trial. As we examine these conflicting positions, the weight of Cole's experiences and their impact on his actions remains a poignant point of legal and moral contention. This case isn't just about the past abuses at Dozier, but raises significant questions about culpability, the long-term effects of institutional trauma, and the fairness of the death penalty in such contexts. The judiciary now stands at a crossroads, balancing justice for the victims with the haunting legacy of a broken system that once chewed up and spit out boys like Lauren Cole. When we consider the case of Lauren Cole, we find ourselves at the confluence of several deeply complex and troubling issues. Cole's story isn't merely one of a man convicted of a heinous crime. It encompasses the broader social and legal responsibilities we bear as a society. Let's start by unpacking the ethical dimensions of the death penalty itself, particularly in light of Cole's traumatic past. The death penalty has always been a contentious issue. Advocates argue it serves as a deterrent and a just retribution for the gravest of crimes. On the other hand, opponents raise concerns about its moral legitimacy, the possibility of wrongful convictions, and the idea that state-sponsored execution essentially mirrors the violence it seeks to condemn. But Cole's case introduces an additional layer of complexity. 
How should we view the death penalty when the condemned individual cites extreme childhood trauma as a pivotal factor in their descent into criminality? Lauren Cole's experiences at the Dozier School for Boys bring a significant moral question to the forefront. To what extent should past abuses shape our judgment and potential sentencing in criminal cases? For six harrowing months at Dozier, Cole allegedly endured unimaginable tortures, being raped by a guard, beaten weakly, and suffering two broken legs from an escape attempt. His lawyers argue that such severe abuse inflicted during his formative years undeniably contributed to his later behaviors and violent actions. This raises the question of moral culpability. If a person's tragic past leads them down a path of criminality, does that person bear the full moral weight of their actions? Or do we share some collective blame for allowing institutions like Dozier to exist unchecked for so long? The ethical implications are profound. They call into question the very principles of justice and the state's role in both punishing and potentially rehabilitating individuals who have been victims of systemic abuse. Moreover, Cole's case challenges the adequacy of our current legal frameworks in dealing with evidence of trauma. His attorneys highlight that the jury that sentenced him to death in 1995 was unaware of his experiences at Dozier. They argue that this missing context could have led to a different outcome, potentially resulting in a life sentence rather than death. If the jury had known about the abuse he endured, would their perception of his moral culpability have shifted? It's a significant question because it touches on how the legal system values and integrates psychological trauma and its long-term impacts on human behavior. The state's counter-argument is that this evidence has been previously considered in Cole's numerous appeals and doesn't change the egregious nature of his crime. But does that truly address the root of the issue, which is the fair assessment of moral and legal responsibility? Additionally, the fact that Governor DeSantis signed a bill providing reparations to other Dozier survivors adds an ironic twist. The state acknowledges the school's atrocious history and compensates victims, yet seeks to execute one of them. This dichotomy brings us back to a fundamental ethical inquiry. Can we reconcile these two actions without challenging our concept of justice? Reflecting on the broader implications, Cole's case forces us to examine the balance between retribution, rehabilitation, and redemption. Can a society ever justifiably take the life of someone who themselves was subjected to state-sanctioned violence and neglect? It also invites us to consider the potential for reform and the necessary checks and balances to prevent such abuses from happening again. In conclusion, the moral and legal questions raised by Lauren Cole's case are not just about one man's fate, but about the deeper values we hold as a society. Do we believe in the capacity for human transformation? Can we acknowledge past mistakes while seeking a future where justice is tempered by compassion and understanding? These are the questions that Cole's story leaves us grappling with, urging us to reflect on our collective humaneness and the true essence of justice. Following Governor Ron DeSantis's signing of a death warrant for Lauren Cole, the legal landscape around this case advanced rapidly. Cole's attorneys have filed a flurry of motions aimed at vacating his death sentence, with their most significant argument centering on the complicity of the state in the abuse Cole experienced at the Dozier School for Boys. According to court documents, Cole's lawyers assert that the horrific treatment he endured at Dozier profoundly shaped his life choices, and that jurors in his original trial were never informed of these critical mitigating circumstances. One of the motions, filed in Marion County Circuit Court, calls attention to the 2011 appeal to the Florida Supreme Court, which argued that the abuse Cole suffered at Dozier was so severe and torturous that it merited reconsideration of his death sentence. Cole's legal team has strenuously argued that his jury should have been privy to this part of his past, suggesting that such knowledge could reasonably have resulted in a life sentence rather than the death penalty. Yet the state's lawyers counter that these are not new arguments. The treatment Cole received at Dozier was brought up over a decade ago, and they maintain that if this evidence were indeed sufficient to alter his sentence, it would have already done so. The jury in Cole's initial trial took into account various forms of abuse he suffered as a child as mitigating factors but still recommended the death penalty. Adding another layer of complexity is the timing of Governor DeSantis's actions. Shortly before signing Cole's death warrant, DeSantis endorsed a bill allocating $20 million to compensate former Dozier students who suffered abuse. This juxtaposition has triggered sharp critiques from death penalty opponents. 
They argue it's contradictory for the state to recognize the severe consequences of Dozier's abuses by offering reparations, while still proceeding with the execution of one of its victims. Maria Deliberato, executive director of Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty, lambasted this dissonance, calling it unconscionable. Cole's legal team has filed appeals with the hope of obtaining a stay of execution. They present two main fronts, the need to reassess the psychological impact of Cole's dozier experiences in light of new state acknowledgments and compensation, and a more recent medical argument. Cole's attorneys argue that his Parkinson's disease symptoms would exacerbate the pain and suffering during execution by lethal injection, potentially making the process inhumane. However, these appeals faced staunch opposition from the state. Governor DeSantis, who carries unilateral authority over execution warrants in Florida, has reportedly tied his political leanings to a tough-on-crime agenda. This connection is evident from his active push for the reduction of the jury unanimity requirement in death penalty cases, requiring only 8 out of 12 jurors to recommend a death sentence. In these complex interplays between law, politics, and ethics, Cole's fate now rests with the Florida Supreme Court. They will consider both the claims related to his abuse at Dozier and his current medical condition before making a final decision on his execution. As we await their ruling, the broader implications of Cole's case prompt ongoing reflection about justice, the death penalty, and the responsibility of the state in addressing past wrongs. As we navigate through the unsettling and deeply complex case of Lauren Cole, it's crucial that we pause and ponder the broader implications that it presents. This is not just a story about one man's criminal actions and his bid for clemency. It's also a reflection of our societal values and the justice system that upholds them. Consider the abuse that occurred at the Dozier School for Boys. How do we reconcile the stories of torture and brutalization with our contemporary values of human rights and dignity? The state has acknowledged its past failures by compensating some survivors, yet how do we balance this recognition with the decision to execute one of those same survivors? Does that decision undermine the state's acknowledgement of its wrongful past? When we think about Lauren Cole, it is important to remember that his grim experiences at Dozier are not unique. They are shared by many who pass through those gates. The abuse turned young lives into narratives of suffering, often setting them on courses that veered into further violence and criminality. How do we measure culpability when a system itself may have contributed to shaping a person's destructive path? Reflect on the moral responsibilities we carry as a society. Should past abuses and childhood traumas play a significant role in how we sentence individuals for crimes committed later in life? Would knowing the full extent of Cole's abuse at Dozier have swayed the jury's decision towards life imprisonment instead of the death penalty? More broadly, what does this case say about the use of the death penalty itself? Are we, as a society, comfortable with capital punishment when cases like Cole's reveal layers of complexity and moral ambiguity? Does executing someone who has endured such documented trauma achieve true justice? Or is it an act of retribution that ignores deeper systemic issues? I urge you, our listeners, to reflect on these questions and share your perspectives. How should our justice system handle cases where past institutional abuse is a critical factor? What do you think about the death penalty in contexts as complex and morally charged as this one? Your insights and voices are valuable to this dialogue. Please join our community discussion to leave your comments. Engage with each other, debate, and let's continue to examine these tough questions together. Remember, justice isn't just a legal concept. It's a societal duty that requires continuous scrutiny and empathy. Stay tuned, stay engaged, and let's keep this critical conversation alive. As we draw this episode of The Real Crime Diary, daily dose of crime to a close, let's take a moment to revisit some key points from our discussion. Lauren Cole's case is steeped in complexity, reflecting the profound impact that early trauma can have on the trajectory of a person's life. Our exploration of the Dozier School for Boys illuminated a grim chapter in history, exposing the harrowing abuse that Cole and many others endured. These experiences, buried for decades, have resurfaced to shape the legal arguments in his current plea to vacate his death sentence. The heart of the matter raises significant moral and legal questions. Should the state consider past abuses in sentencing decisions? Can we equitably balance the scales of justice when the system itself is implicated in the traumas that influenced a condemned man's actions? Lauren Cole's story serves as a poignant reminder of the broader implications of institutional abuse and the heavy burden carried by its survivors. 
It challenges us to consider the role of retributive justice and the moral weight of the death penalty. As we ponder these complex issues, let's remember the human elements at the core of these legal battles. I hope today's episode has sparked reflection and raised important questions for you, our listeners. We invite you to share your thoughts and engage in this ongoing dialogue about justice, accountability, and the death penalty. Thank you for tuning in to The Real Crime Diary Daily Dose of Crime. Join us again next time as we continue to explore the intricate layers of real crime stories. Stay safe, stay curious, and keep questioning. Do you believe Lauren Cole's past should have influenced his sentencing? Leave a comment below. If you find these deep dives into true crime compelling, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications. Let's keep the conversation alive. Share this episode with others and see what they think. Thank you for joining me, MHB, on The Real Crime Diary Daily Dose of Crime. This episode isn't just a story. It's a call to reflect on our justice system, our past, and how we balance punishment with compassion. Share your thoughts, share this episode, and stay tuned for more deep dives into the stories that challenge us to think differently about crime and justice. Until next time, take care and stay safe. As the clock ticks down to Cole's execution date, the debates intensify. Will you stand with those who see his execution as a final act of injustice? Or do you believe that his crime is too severe to warrant mercy? Comment below and let's keep this conversation going.